I should have given you a better bio. That one was probably written by Desiree Book. <laughs> I call them Desperate Book because they publish my stuff. And uh, it's pretty funny. I was down at the Desert Industries the other day, and I found one of my books that was almost brand new. And I opened up the front cover, and I had given it to one of my neighbors. And uh, it was there, and so I bought it for a dollar, and I took it home, and I showed it to my wife, and I said, look, the Marshes took this to the TI, and she said, oh, let's give it to him again. <laughs> so it's going to be like the cat that just keeps coming back, and they, they can't get rid of it, you know. Uh, but anyway, it's great to be with you, and great to be able to talk about the Book of Mormon, which I love. Anytime somebody wants me to talk about the Book of Mormon, I'm, I'm, I'm right there. And when I saw the, uh, the theme, Experience the Book of Mormon, I thought, boy, I know exactly what I'd like to talk about. Uh, because I experienced a lot of the Book of Mormon, um, not only in reading it, but in working in my, in my yard. So I thought this would be perfect if they'd let me use uh, that title. I begin almost every one of my talks with a joke about my last name because people just don't believe it. As recently as two weeks ago, somebody asked me, now is that really your name? And yes, by the way, it's really my name. And uh, yes, it is a prepositional phrase. And yes, I have thought about naming my son Owen. Owen, by the way, blah, blah, blah. And all of those things. But today I just don't have time, except I did find one Book of Mormon way to joke about my last name. I've, I've done a search, and you can do this on your phone, but I think it was over 140 times the name, by the way, appears in the standard works. And in one place, Nephi sounds like he's talking to me. Second Nephi chapter 32, Nephi says, He have wondered what you should do after you have entered in, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Nephi, I have wondered that. Shed some light on that for me. In the seminary manual, there's a little graphic. For 2 Nephi 32, it says that they take keywords and phrases out of the chapter. And look, by the way, is a keyword and phrase. And look, it's defined, by the way, on the path that leads to eternal life. <laughs> so, for the rest of the uh, conference, you can call me brother on the path. That works just fine. One time I was holding my scriptures that have been embossed with my name on the front. And my thumb was covering up John and Bob. And I saw my scriptures, and it said, the way. And I thought, that works. <laughs> Show us the way. Jesus said, I am the way. I, I'm by the way. I'll take it. Tease me all you want. I don't care. So, uh, But I love it. But I love joking about it. And uh, it gives me something to talk about with the, with the teenagers. But today, I want to talk about experiencing the Book of Mormon in the garden. There is something that Jesus said, um, 3rd Nephi chapter 23, that I've always wondered what he meant, and I really wish I could uh, get a ticket to this event to see something like this. It came to pass when Jesus had expounded all the scriptures in one. I don't know how long that took. I'm not sure exactly what it meant. I've heard people speculate on what it might have meant. Maybe all of them and how they pointed to him or something like that. But uh, I've noticed as I've been teaching the Gospels up at the BYU Salt Lake Center and the Book of Mormon for many years, started to see things that connected, and I began to wonder, especially as I worked in the garden. So today I want to talk first, not about the Book of Mormon, but about the Bible. And one of Jesus' wonderful parables, the parable of the sower, which has also been called the parable of the four kinds or the four types of soil. And you've heard this before in Matthew 13. Um, a sower went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the way. Side. Uh, see, already twice. Some seeds fell by the wayside. Unfortunately, that's a negative example. And the fowls came and devoured them up. This is a James C. Christensen artwork. And these, uh, the sower, it's kind of interesting to research about it, because the, the motion of throwing was kind of like, if I understand correctly, like a discus thrower. And, uh, in fact, the word broadcast does not come from television and radio. It comes from seed sowing. So they would cast the seeds broadly, which teaches us something about where we throw the gospel out to. But, and because of that, they fell in all of these different places, four different places. Some fell up among uh, thorns. Uh, some fell in shallow places where they couldn't get any root. Some fell in good ground. After Jesus gives this parable... The disciples, no, the disciples, not everybody, we imagine perhaps some walked away, but the disciples came and said, why are you teaching in parables? And this is when Jesus gave that great answer and noted the call of Isaiah. Some will see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, be converted and be healed. Some won't because they won't think about it. But anyway, Jesus gives that answer and then says, hear the parable of the sower and gives the interpretation 
So the hard, that's the by the wayside, four types of soil where the fowls devoured it up. This is ground that had been walked on not just for a season, but perhaps for generations. And so the seeds did not fall deeply. They fell on top of it. The fowls came and devoured it up. Jesus said in the interpretation, verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. Some of my students have objected and thought, well, that doesn't sound fair. They didn't understand it. I like to use the wording that is in some of the other places where the seeds fell, and that is the word right here. They received it. Perhaps they didn't receive it. We remember that uh, in the latter part of the book of Mosiah, when some that were there to hear King Benjamin's speech, it said they could not, they did not believe it, therefore they did not understand. And we think, should we reverse those? They didn't understand it, therefore they didn't believe it? No, they didn't believe it. There's a believing heart element in there. Some didn't receive the seed. That's how I like to, to look at it. Uh, what's the next part of ground? Oh, just important to know, the principle there, what do we learn? Well, if we're going to try and grow a testimony, there will be opposition. The Lord told Joseph Smith, section 10, Satan thinketh to overpower your testimony in this generation. He'll seek to overpower ours as well. There will always be opposition. This is my uncle's... Uh, Almost a farm, pretty big garden up in Bountiful. What is the desirable plant there? Strawberries. And what's happening? People are walking by and stomping on the shoots that are going out and kind of creating this barrier, kind of like the, the hard ground, uh, the by the wayside ground, where a seed can't be received because it's, it's too hard. Uh, Alma, in Alma chapter 36, he uses a phrase that I have to tell my students about because I did not grow up on a farm. In uh, this wonderful chiasmus chapter, Alma 36, I was racked with eternal torment, for my soul was, what's the word? Harrowed up. Up to the greatest degree, and racked with all my sins. The soil is our hearts. I've heard uh, Elder Hafen call it our heartland, where the gospel can fall into our hearts. If a heart is hard, Alma uses the word, if you had stubbornness of heart, what do you need to do? You need to harrow it. And he uses the word twice. While I was thus racked with torment, while I was harrowed up with the memory of my many sins, I remembered also to have heard my father prophesying to the people concerning the coming of one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to atone for the sins of the world, is the center of that uh, masterpiece of chiasmus about Christ. And his ground, his heart needed to be harrowed so that God could plant a new seed. And it's fun to see how Alma continues with this metaphor in other places, not just talking to the... Uh, we're talking to the Zoramites where he talks about seed and soil, which we'll get to in a minute, or seed and season. This is a modern harrow. Try to imagine that for a family who needs negativity. Lie down, we're going to drag this over you. And to, to see what it's like to have your heart harrowed. That's a modern harrow. Here's an ancient harrow. And ground that is hardened needs to be harrowed, broken up, uh, so that a seed can be, can be planted. So the first... Soil was the by the wayside that was hard. The next, Jesus said, was the shallow places. And they sprung up, but because, because they had no root, they withered away. Uh, watch for the word root and how important it becomes later on as we keep talking. So there's obviously a good layer of soil because a plant springs up, but it isn't deeply rooted. I went to a little place in Nazareth called the Nazareth Jesus Knew. Has anybody been there before? And it's all kind of walled off, and you can go in there, and there's a little vineyard. And they've got people in period costumes and animals and everything. And I remember just walking around and poking my fingers into the dirt and hitting so many rocks. Why do you build a tower? Well, maybe it's something to do with all those rocks, right? And hitting limestone and thinking, I can see how this could happen. A seed can start to send a root, but then hits rock that you cannot, cannot see. Jesus said, he that receives seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it, yet he hath not root. In himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Next was the overgrown, the among thorns ground. They sprung up, but uh, the other plants choked them. Uh, so what do, we, what do we know? Well, it's good soil because there's other plants in there, but they're competing for the water, the sun, and the nutrients. So Jesus said, He that receives seed among thorns is he that heareth the word. And this is wonderful. Jesus gives us the weeds. What are the possible weeds that can grow in our heartland, in our hearts? The care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. It's 
fun to have a discussion with your students. How are deceit, the riches deceitful? I have a book at home called Money for Nothing about people who won the lottery in Michigan uh, over the years. And there are a few chapters where people said, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. Winning the lottery. Uh, because people treat them differently. Uh, they suddenly have relatives they didn't know that they had. With problems they didn't know that they had. All sorts of things. Worst thing, one guy said, I spend my life with lawyers and lawsuits. And how are riches deceitful? Well, maybe that's something we could look at. Uh, the cares of this world is footnoted, two footnotes to section 39 and 40 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And very quickly, because I have to hustle, this is the story of James Colville. This is the entire section 40. The heart of my servant James Colville was right before me. He covenanted with me that he would obey my word and received the word with gladness. But straightway Satan tempted him in, here's the weeds, the fear of persecution, and the cares of the world caused him to reject the word. Wherefore, he broke my covenant, it remaineth with me to do with him, it seemeth me good. That's the entire section, but we see someone who is overcome with the weeds in the heartland that Jesus mentions. So, the Mark version of the parable of the sower mentions lusts of other things in Mark chapter 9. I might want to see that as well. There are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. I haven't counted them myself, but I read that. This, to me, is one of the more interesting ones. Deuteronomy 22.9. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers seeds, lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. What on earth principle could that be teaching there? I was uh, walking up, and this is the place State Park with my Ward's Youth Conference, and I saw, do you see the desirable plant in there? See the corn? I'm just kind of far away. What's the undesirable plant? Morning Glory, you're on the radio show, they call it bindweed. Doesn't that sound awful? And I looked at that and I thought, boy, somebody should come and weed this patch. And so I took a picture and walked away. <laughs> to show how helpful I was. But I thought of this planting your vineyard with diverse seeds and how, how, you, how are you going to grow corn if all these other things, including something called bindweed, is competing for the sun and the nutrients in the soil. Uh, Elder McConkey said, if a seed falls among thorns, it's in good soil. As evidenced by the growth of the undesirable plant, but the good uh, undesirable plants, but the good plant soon dies because it cannot overcome the influence of the weeds and thistles. And then he kind of mixes his parables here and says, and instead of gaining eternal life, they shall be burned with the tares which overcame them. That's a scary verse, a scary quote. And lastly, Jesus said, Some fell into good ground, and he that receives seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also bear fruit, bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Jesus talked about the soil. When I was a single, uh, young single adult at BYU, in fact, I, I surpassed my young single adult, went into my thirties and became clearly a menace to society, and I thought, maybe if I buy a house, I'll be more attractive. And so I bought a house in South Provo, and I was still not attractive, and now I had a mortgage. So, uh, but I had this big backyard, and I thought, I'm going to... Do what my dad taught me to do. I'm going to go grow some tomatoes. Dad worked us in the garden like crazy. The day before I entered the MTC, I was hauling manure up the front lawn. Uh, dad gave us a worth work ethic. I couldn't wait to go to the MTC and get a break. But, uh, so I went to Ernst Home Center. Anybody remember that? I said, this is what I want to plant. First question was, what kind of soil do you have? First question, what kind of soil do you have? Here's Jesus starting with the soil. What kind of soil do you have? Is it hard? Is it overgrown? Is it uh, shallow? Is it overgrown? Or is it good soil? So Jesus taught us about the soil. Who can teach us about the seed? Well, clearly that's going to be Alma. In Alma 32 and 33, which is what we talked about, which Brother Wright talked about even. And it's a wonderful story. This man is not signaling touchdown, but this is a... A, a depiction of somebody on top of the Red Mountain. And I, this is today's most worthless chart coming up. But I just love the Book of Mormon because nobody in the Book of Mormon is ever mildly surprised. They are always astonished. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> nobody ever says that's a surprise. They are always astonished to some degree. And so here's today's most worthless chart. There's one case of being less astonished, nine cases of being astonished, one more astonished, Two greatly astonished, nine of exceedingly astonished, or astonished exceedingly, but my friends, there is only one astonished beyond all measure. And that is in this story. They hear 
the prayer atop of the Randy Umptum and it's off the charts. Doesn't that, isn't that what that means, to be beyond all measure, off the charts? And I just hope someday we get to see, maybe in the Book of Mormon videos, a depiction of what that looks like, to be astonished beyond all measure. I just want to see what that looks like. And when you read the prayer, don't you smile, don't you shake your head. So glad we've been elected to be thy holy children, all else were thrust by thy wrath down to hell, for which holiness God, O oh God, we thank thee. And thou hast made it known unto us that there will be no Christ. And boy, that's the one that really hits him. And so they say this prayer, we better try the virtue of the word of God as we go in there and, and teach the Zoramites. But I just thought that would be fun for you, evidently a few of you did too. So, uh, Alma gets up in front of the Zoramites, and there's a group of the poor who show up. Why didn't Alma stand up and say, thank you for your question. You remember, a man who was chief among the poor came up and said, what about us? We built these synagogues with our bare hands, and they won't even let us in into worship because of the coarseness of our apparel. What shall these, my brethren, do? Alma did not say, a sower went forth to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell by the way. He said, no, because up walked good soil. They had been harrowed. They had been through harrowing experiences. Their poverty had given them humility. So President Eyring says, just as a soil needs preparation for a seed, so does a human heart for the word of God to take root. Before he told the people to plant the seed, Alma told them their hearts were prepared. They were already good soil. They had been persecuted, cast out of their churches, out with his love, and the circumstances of their lives, the harrowing, which led them to be humble, had prepared them. They were then ready to hear the word of God, and if they chose to plant it in their hearts, the growth in their souls would surely follow, and that would increase their faith. So Jesus teaches, teaches us about the soil, and Alma teaches us about the seed. Now, how do you know if the seed is good? I had no idea how big this room would be and how small our streams would be, so I apologize, but you can write down the reference. The long answer, how do you know if a seed is good? Well, you can walk up to the seed store and buy a seed, and it might even say guaranteed on it. Guaranteed what? The only way to really know is to plant it. It's the only way. And Alma says, let's compare the word unto a seed. If you will give place, which is a great phrase, we can spend a whole class on what does it mean to give place? My daughter's on a mission in France right now. She's been there three weeks on Monday in Lyon, France. And, uh, <laughs> So excited to hear her experiences. If you he, will give place, if you will willfully suspend disbelief for a minute, if you will give place that a seed may be planted in your heart, if it be a true seed, or if you could just give me that it's a good seed. I don't know if it's true, but I know it's good. Or if it's a good seed that you do not cast it out by your unbelief, that you resist the Spirit of the Lord, behold, it will begin to swell. Some have looked at this verse and thought, is Alma giving us different ways that the Spirit works in us swell a physical reaction? When you feel these swelling motions, you will begin to say, it must needs be this is a good seed, or the seed is good, for it begins to enlarge my soul. Different reaction. It begins to enlighten my understanding. That's something that might happen in your head. Uh, yea, it begins to be delicious to me. I don't understand this all, but it tastes good to me, intellectually. So seminary teachers love this. They circle S-E-E-D for swell, enlarge, enlighten, and delicious, and say to their students, look, the seed, and here's different ways. Okay, that's the long answer. How do you know if the seed is good? You want the short answer? Because <laughs> now it gives it. Therefore, if the seed growth, it's good. Growth not, it's not good. <laughs> that's the short answer. But he's going to ask them to plant a seed. Uh, what is the seed? Okay, test question if you take my 122 class. If you answer faith, the only thing wrong with that answer is it's incorrect. <laughs> Other than that, it's a really good answer. This is what Amulek says when he gets up. He says, begin to believe in the Son of God. Notice what's in green. That he will uh, uh, redeem, atone, resurrect, and judge, and plant this word in your hearts. And that is, it beginneth to swell, nourish it by your Faith. Is faith the seed? No, faith is what you nourish the seed with. The seed is the word. The seed is Christ and his mission. Of course it is. That's what they said they didn't believe in on top of the Remiantum. And so he had to say, I'm going to plant the word. I'm going to plant Christ in your hearts. Don't cast it out. What is Christ? What is he going to do? He's going to redeem, atone, resurrect, and judge. Now if you take my 121 class, you'll get that answer. Right. Okay, but what if the seed doesn't grow? Notice this tie back to Jesus' parable of the soils. 
This is not because the seed was not good, neither is it because the fruit thereof would not be desirable. It's because your ground is barren. Footnote 39a, Matthew 13. You gotta fix your ground. It's your heartland that's messed up. This is, you can just imagine out, no, this is a good seed. Oh, this is a good seed. Don't cast out the seed, please. This is a good seed. If you cast it out, the problems with your ground, and notice also, and ye will not nourish the tree. What's the difference between will not and cannot? I refuse to nourish it. That's a big difference. We gotta move. First of all, there's the soil, then the seed, and then there's the season. Uh, I was very concerned that they give it time to grow roots. Um, in fact, let me do something I do with my classes. It might be juvenile, but it'll keep you moving before lunch. When you hear the word root, hear the word root, snap your fingers, would you? Let us nourish it with great, great care that it may get root, that it may grow up and bring forth fruit unto us. And now behold, if you will nourish it with much care, it will get root. And grow up and bring forth fruit. But if you neglect the tree, take no thought for its nourishment. Behold, it will not get any root. And when the heat of the sun cometh and scorcheth it, because it hath no root, it withers away, and you pluck it up and cast it out. The season is an opportunity to grow roots. And it takes time. I love that Jesus' parable wasn't the parable of the lightning and thunder, or the now you know and now you don't know. But it takes time. I love to ask my students, how long does it take, if you plant an apple tree, for example, to actually get an apple? Three or four years before you actually get an apple. So would you be patient? Uh, in fact, uh, the word nourishment is here. Because of time, I'm going to just let you see that. Skip it. <laughs> I'm driving down Highland Drive in Salt Lake City, and I'm such a weirdo. I got out of the car. I had to take a picture of this. <laughs> this grass right here, I wish I had it that quality in my front yard. And right next to it was dandelions. What did Matt, what was I, 12, 12, call it? Thistles? That's what I think of them. I read somewhere that dandelions were imported from Europe. And I thought, there is a special place in outer darkness for that person to come <laughs> I know, it was because the leaves can be eaten as a salad, but, I mean, my kids, when we were planting sod, picked up one of those stems with that ball of death on it. <gasps> and you blow them out everywhere and you can't find them. And dandelions, it, they're omnipresent. They're everywhere. This teaches us something, doesn't it? Go clear a piece of ground. Go to Home Depot, get your camera out so you can take a picture and say, where are your dandelion seeds? <laughs> and then take a picture of the look, they'll be exceedingly astonished, right? <laughs> because they'll say, you don't need dandelion seeds, they are everywhere. Just clear a spot, they will come out of thin air, and they will, won't they? Do you know what happened right here? We moved. That's it. <laughs> That's all that happened. All you have to do to have the weeds take over is nothing. It's not the same for the other stuff that you want. Elder Neely Maxwell said, Lack of intellectual humility is there among those who have deliberately cultivated their doubts. In order, they think, to release themselves from their covenants, some nurture their grievances assiduously. Were their grievances, grievances instead on the seed, they would have long ago nourished a mighty tree of testimony. That's a good one, Gotta move. Okay, well, what if it doesn't grow? You have to use FDP. This is what I call fertilizer. What am I saying for FDP? Look. If you will nourish the word as it begins to grow by your faith, with great diligence, and with patience, looking forward to the fruit thereof, it shall take root. Snap your fingers. And it will be a tree springing up into everlasting life because of your diligence and your faith and your patience. Diligence and faith sounds like faith and diligence sounds like faith and works. Faith works and patience. Uh, and there it is again in verse 43. Okay, lastly, we have to connect this. To the last thing, I just think that Jesus' parable of the soils is part one of a four-part story. First there's the soil, then there's the seed, then there's the season, and then there's the supper. And it's in Alma 32. If you will not nourish the word, looking forward with an eye of faith to the fruit thereof, you can never pluck of the fruit of the, say, tree of life. That's what we're, these are all connected. Not by me, by the footnotes. I mean, it's all there. I think this is a wonderful story. And I think I learned more in my garden of pondering this than probably by sitting and reading it. I'm going to skip that for time. Uh, God didn't give Lehi a revelation about four types of soil, or about planting a seed, or about caring for the plant. Lehi saw the mature result or fruit of the soil, seed, and season, and the world's and his own family's reaction to it.
You've probably seen this before, and today you can't see it because it's too small. But if you can take the four types of soil in, in, uh, in Matthew 13, and they correspond exactly to the four groups in Lehi's dream. Exactly. In fact, they even use some of the same language. And why not? It's the same story, which is remarkable. So, my garden in the backyard, here's what I learned. If you want good things to grow in your garden or in your life, you have to put them there. I think this is what Jesus and Alma are teaching us. You have to put them there. They don't come in spontaneously. Dandelions do. Thistles do. Thorns do. You want the good stuff? You have to put it there. That's why I honor you for being here today. Weeds, on the other hand, will come out of nowhere. They are omnipresent. <laughs> Number three, all you have to do to lose your garden or your testimony is nothing. We saw that. And life will be a constant war on weeds. Uh, Brigham Young said, those who want to obtain the celestial kingdom will find they have to battle every day. And that's how it is with the garden. You can't just clear the weeds once and be done. It's going to be an ongoing process. Notice that Alma, when he talked in Alma 36 about why he was preaching, notice what he said. I have labored without ceasing that I might bring souls unto repentance, that I might bring them to taste of the exceeding joy in which I did taste. He didn't say feel. What did he say? Same metaphor. He's still using it. Uh, Ephesians 3, that Christ the seed may dwell in your hearts, which is the soil, your soil by faith, the e being rooted and grounded in love. Ground is a good thing there. Mom said to me, you're grounded. I, by that definition, I can say, oh, thanks, Mom. You're grounded, too. So that was a, <laughs> may be able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, the length, the depth, the height. That's a season. And to know the love of Christ, which is the supper, the fruit of the tree. Amazing. So that's my little thesis today. Today was more application than interpretation or, or a, a scholarship type of a thing. But I love the Book of Mormon for things like this that it can teach us. God is interested in gardens. Uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, As we read, ponder, and pray, there will come into our minds a view of the three gardens of God. The Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Garden of the Empty Tomb, where Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. He's interested in gardens, and I'm thankful for the inspiration that has come to me experiencing these ideas in the garden. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.